Our presentation is on Peruvian, specifically Andean textiles. We'll be looking at their history, cultural significance, and modern context. Let's begin with a history of textiles. Textiles are considered the first art form in the Andes, as they have been used extensively as a form of cultural, religious, and personal expression since the second millennium BC. Textiles have been used to represent political, social, and occupational status, and did so through their material, color, and motifs. As well, they held special importance for funerary rites, as they served as wrapping for sacred mummy bundles and costumes for the afterlife. Textiles have often served both religious and utilitarian purposes, as woven cloths are often used to carry items, and even children, on women's backs. Since Quechua and most other Andean languages are oral, textiles also served as a means of recording histories and stories. Pictured here is a textile fragment showing birds that was made from cotton by the Chincha people sometime between 800 and 1300 CE. Historically, techniques for textile arts included weaving, dyeing, knotting, and plating. Many materials were used for weaving, including cotton in the lowlands and the wool of llamas in the Andes, with cotton crops predating maize in the lowlands. The tools used to weave were also extremely important, and baskets filled with them have often been found in pre-colonial Andean tombs. Natural dyes were most often made from cochineal, an insect that when mixed with different salts, produces various pigments. This practice is still in use today, as we saw examples of this in Chinchero, Amaro, and in Dona Rosa Maria's Botanical Garden, which is pictured here. During the time of the Inca, the use of alpaca and llama wool for textile production greatly expanded, as llama herding was deliberately expanded by the Inca. The type of cloth and ornamentation used to make a person's clothing denoted the wearer's status, as can be seen from textiles preserved in burials throughout Peru. While some burials display elegant new garments, others include worn ordinary clothes. Pictured here is a textile fragment made from cotton and camelid wool fibers by the Chanque people between 800 and 1300 CE. It features geometric motif patterns and hand embroidery using the camelid wool on a piece of cotton cloth. Now, we will dive into how textiles are actually made. Firstly, let's discuss the wool. Wool is gathered from alpacas, llamas, and other cameloids native to the Andes region. Using a plant called sacta, which acts as a detergent, the wool is cleaned. Then, the fibers are spun to be converted into thread. Andean spinning of wool uses a spool and relies on the use of gravity to pull the fibers into a thread. The thinner the thread, the higher the quality of the eventual textile. The wool is then dyed by being submerged into pots of boiling dye stuff. Stabilizing agents with salt or acid bases are typically added to alter the hues, increase the binding capacity of the dye, or the vibrancy of the colors. The wool is then left to dry. Next, the wool is respun into thread and then typically plied. Plying yarn refers to the act of twisting more than one thread with another to create a stronger thread. The wool is then gathered into a ball to make for easier weaving. So now let's talk about the loom. Andean looms are quite mobile and come in many variations. However, most looms have a similar parent structure. Fibers are tensioned on the y-axis and these ones are called the warp. They are held up between two warp bars. Yarn on the x-axis, is called the weft, and it is the yarn that is woven over and under the warp yarn to create certain patterns. Together, the warp and weft create a grid-like structure that eventually forms a textile. To keep tension in the warp, one end of the warp is attached to a fixed point, and the other side is either handheld by the weaver, as seen in smaller textiles, or the warp bar is attached to a strap that goes around the weaver's hips. This is called a backstrap. Most common Andean patterns use a complementary warp technique, meaning that there is an inversion of colors from the front to back side. For example, a red bird on a blue background would appear as a blue bird on a red background on the back side. Now let's look at contemporary textiles. In Andean communities, there's been a big movement in recent decades to revitalize textile production. In the beginning of the 20th century, education was seen as a way to build a new indigenous subject who meets the needs for the definition of a nation state and for ongoing modernization. 
Indigenous people of the Andes attended schools that taught them a variety of subjects, but traditional teachings like weaving were lost. Reintroducing weaving as part of the curriculum in many Campesino and Andean communities has been a way of decolonizing the education system in Peru by critiquing the prioritization and universality of Western subjects. It has also been a means to keep alive a collective cultural memory by passing on the practice. The practice was never lost, but it certainly diminished in cultural importance post-conquest. Remembering traditions of the community is an act of cultural resistance against colonial teachings and attempts at, at indigenous erasure. Our visit to Kusi Causeway was an example of indigenous teachings being incorporated into the Andean curriculum. A big part of the practices native to the region include weaving. So in the eighth grade, all students begin learning. Weaving is considered a skill that well-adjusted adults should know. So it's a skill that should be taught to all young members of the community. The children begin weaving on smaller looms, and as they become more skilled, they progress to the looms with the backstrap. Using traditional textiles as decorations on commodities branded as indigenous and targeted at the tourism market leads to the fragmentation of the original products, as, which has been prevalent. It's nuanced because in a post-colonial time, the commodification of textiles targeted towards tourists allows the weavers to make a living and continues to practice and share the craft. However, the potential dilution of the significance of the motifs can decontextualize the Andean culture and belief systems. Our time shopping for textiles has been riddled primarily with local women selling their wares, and we've encountered a range of price points and descriptions of textiles. In Cusco, the llama motif was plastered on all the wholesale sweaters that were made out of a synthetic acrylic composition. These sweaters were sold for a barterable and inexpensive price. Just steps away, there were more curated stores dedicated to using finer, pure fibers, but the products were devoid of iconographically Andean motifs. Meanwhile, when we visited Amaru, much of our visit was dedicated to time for us to purchase textiles. The pieces being sold were consumer focused. They included bags, bracelets, shawls, and throws all easy items for a consumer to buy as a gift for someone at home, or as a small token of remembrance for their time spent with the community. All three stores seem to alter their products for the tourist consumer, deviating from the authenticity of the Andean textile. However, the differing price points and aesthetics make for good business, which is central to the survival of these communities and their ability to be able to weave for themselves. At Amaru, they had us dress in their traditional style. The utilitarian use of the clothing for hard physical labor was new to us, as in our culture, such precious clothing is kept carefully clean. For Amaru, the clothing was valuable in its cultural significance, but was still viewed as functional. Perhaps they use less intrinsically valuable pieces on the tourists who come to their community, or perhaps it was all part of allowing us to partake in a performative spectacle. While in Chinchero, we learned that most contemporary Andean textiles use synthetic dyes because they are quite convenient. There has been a movement to revitalize the use of natural dyes, but they are more labor intensive and less stable to work with. Tourists purchasing a textile with natural dyes will certainly pay the price. Synthetic dyes have potential to contaminate water sources, but with proper care, they can be an efficient means of textile production. The use of synthetic dyes challenges the notion that indigeneity and associated traditional practices are in conflict with modernity. Modernity and indigeneity can coexist as some technological developments can aid the production of cultural products. However, the potentially damaging effects of synthetic dyes can be a cautionary tale to not prioritize Western modernity that might actually be quite damaging and unsustainable to the planet. Now let's look at some current projects. Weaving Communities of Practice was a pilot project that aimed to create a knowledge base of Andean weaving designed to contribute to curatorial practice and heritage policy. Andean weaving is a topic that is gaining traction in the scholarly community. However, many weavers don't have an academically recognized education that allows them to be primary voices in discussing Andean textiles. As scholarship continues, ensuring Andean voices are not only consulted, but guiding scholarship would be most beneficial to ensuring that weaving practices are properly represented with respect to different facets of cultural and historical significance. Thank you for watching our video. With much love, 
from Anna and Caroline. Thank you.